Good evening. Our uh, regular minister is out of town, and I got asked to fill in on the class tonight. And so the teenagers uh, that aren't Bible bowling or working on speech have joined us tonight. So we've got, got a, a mixed class. Um, I haven't heard a report on Totsi today. I started getting one in the foyer, and then I got grabbed about the... Uh, paperwork for CYC. So can somebody give us an update on, on Totsi? Still at home and still no visitors, okay. I think that's very wise because his immune system will be down. And then uh, the Robinsons had a family member have some surgery. Was it a, a niece or something today? Did anybody know the status of that? So it's already good, okay? Very, very good. Thank you for that update. Let's begin our class with a prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the blessings that you give us. Father, we ask your blessings on those that have been mentioned that are sick. We ask you to be with those who are out of town and traveling and bring them home safely. Father, continue to bless our congregation with strength and unity. Bless us tonight as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. If you uh, have your Bibles and want to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, Going to do a little passage out of there tonight. Ecclesiastes means the preacher. And so Solomon is declaring himself to be the preacher or the teacher, and, and he's writing this. A lot of folks that have written on the book of Ecclesiastes write it like he is lamenting his life, that he's wasted his life. And I don't really take that view. I take the view that he is offering instruction on the things that he's found in life to be meaningless, the things that he's found to be worthless. In fact, the repetitive word in this will be meaningless or, or vanity, vanity. The Hebrew word that's used there is literally vapors. And so he'll talk about something and he'll, de he'll declare it vapors. He'll talk about a topic and he'll declare it to be vapors. Now, I'm not sure if that means much to you. Uh, I played defensive end for a local club football team when I lived in Searcy, Arkansas. And our athletic director was Darrell Webb. Now, you can imagine what a monster defensive end I was at 5 foot 4 inches tall and about 165 pounds. But I was fast and I was mean. And so I really, really, really enjoyed that position. But old Darrell Webb, if I missed a quarterback, he would yell at me, Lonzo, you're chasing vapor trails. And I knew what he meant. He meant I reached my hand out and came back with nothing. Garth Brooks had an album called Roping the Wind. And so that's what Solomon's talking about. He says, if you pursue these things, it's vapors. You reach your hand out and you grab and you bring back nothing. Not only does he talk about that if we pursue these things, we reach out and grab nothing, but also what happens once you reach out and grab nothing, you come back with a handful of nothing, and a vapor is very transient. James will actually use the word in, in Greek and say, what is your life? It is just a mist or a vapor that appears for a little while. So as Solomon talks about the things that he knows about it. And Solomon was in, in, incredibly wise. He made a study of animals. He had a menagerie. He had ships that came back from Africa. If you read in, in the Chronicles and the Kings that he had apes and lions and exotic animals brought in. He did a, a study of plants and animals, and he even had some illustrations where he drew. He, he wrote poems. He was very eclectic in his understanding of a lot of things. And so as he's talking through the book of Ecclesiastes about the things that he's found to be of no value, there are two categories that when he mentions them, he doesn't declare them to be vapors. He doesn't declare them to be meaningless. Can anybody guess what he would find value in, what he would say is not meaningless or is not vapors? That's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> you know, Tim was talking the other night, you ask a rhetorical question, and little kids will answer for you. 
I was in Cloverdale, Indiana, and I was standing in the aisle preaching a gospel meeting and uh, talking about the prodigal son. And I said, who was unhappy when the prodigal son came home? A little girl about the sixth row said, the fatted calf. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, he was unhappy, but we were thinking of somebody else. But So what do you think in Solomon's experience or in Solomon's knowledge he's going to declare not meaningless or not vapors? Wisdom is going to be one, and wisdom is going to be something that he talks about that is, is not wisdom like we think about it, but moral uprightness. The, the, the uh, juxtaposition of a wisdom or a wise man and a fool. The fool is a person who lives immorally, and the wise person is a person who has standards and lives right. So it's not the typical kind of wisdom we think about, although if you have that kind of wisdom, you live morally if you apply it properly. So wisdom is one thing that he's going to find value in. And what's the other thing? Relationship with God, and then there's one more. I think the relationship with God, I was thinking, was obvious because he's going to sum up the book with let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Some translations have the word duty, for this is the whole duty of man. But really that word is, is inserted. Most translations will have that in, in at least parentheses or italics. Uh, but really that verse says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. The, 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 the substance of man, man's all, man's existence is finding an understanding and respect of God and, and fearing Him and obeying Him. goes along with the concept of wisdom. So what's the other thing Solomon's going to find value in? Knowledge and wisdom probably going to be in the same category in my mind if you want to separate them. I think that would be cool. Because, you know, knowledge is what you know. Wisdom is knowing how to use your knowledge. Uh, knowledge is knowing that uh, a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in fruit salad. <laughs> so, you know, that there's a, maybe a subtle difference between wisdom and knowledge. What's he going to find value in? He'll praise diligence probably at some point. Let's explore chapter 4 just a little bit. I'm going to attend an event in uh, Louisville, Texas this weekend. It's uh, right outside Dallas. I, I, I think I'm actually more in Dallas. Louisville, Texas is kind of like Meridianville is to Huntsville. You really don't know when one starts and one stops, but it's the, the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area, and I'm going to get to go over there, and, and the, the, the title of the conference is T3. It's a T with a three, and it stands for Teach the Truth, but it's an evangelism conference, and the topic they've assigned as their theme this year is the phrase out of the Proverbs as iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens the other. And, and my task is to talk, number one, to the kids about being an influence and sharpening somebody else, applying your Christianity to helping somebody become better. Uh, we did some interviews with some guys who are blacksmiths, and one of the guys we talked with uh, talked about this phrase, as iron sharpens iron, uh, I think of smithing, I think of a brutal process. You know, I think of putting something in a forge and getting the metal hot and taking that big hammer and pounding it into shape and then putting it on a grinder and shaping it off. This blacksmith said, really, his understanding of this verse is after you've got a, a blade already made, this is a subtle process, a real gentle process. My, my intern uh, spent three weeks in, in Nepal I'm helping uh, him get his license as a counselor. And uh, when he came back from this trip from Nepal, he brought me one of these weird, funny bent knives. And he said he had it handmade by a knife maker in Nepal. It's in a real nice leather case, and it's heavy. Oh, it's, it's a mean knife. But inside the, the sheath are two smaller knives. And he says these two smaller knives are made out of a special metal that if you nick the blade or if you get an irregularity on, on the point, you take this little bitty shaping knife and you rub it like a whetstone 
and smooth your blade out. And this blacksmith said the, the iron sharpening iron brought into his mind of applying some pressure in a gentle way, an influence to, to make this piece of steel or to make this piece of iron what you want it to be. So as, as, as I approach this topic, that's what I'm going to talk about is being a person of influence in somebody else's life. And I believe that one of the things that Solomon finds value in is he finds value in companionship or in friendship. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 8. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. The first place we get is is if you live your life and you're self-contained, if you're an island unto yourself, and you build great wealth, you can't consume it all on yourself. And if you do consume it all on yourself, what have you got? The first place he starts is that this guy is he's got this wealth. He's he's working, and he says, "Who am I doing this for?" Why am I not just stopping working and going to enjoy myself? But who would I enjoy myself with? This guy's alone. And then he gets to the contrast of that. Chapter 4, verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord with three strands is not quickly broken. And you notice that after he talks about this guy being alone is meaningless... He does not end this discussion with this is vapors. He sees value in companionship. He sees value in camaraderie. He sees value in having close associations. And he makes some observations about this, and and I'd like to kind of spend a little time tonight dissecting that. First thing he says is two are better than one. All right, why are two better than one? He's going to give probably a a list of why, and we'll just take them in order. And I read from the New International Version, uh, and so if you've got a different translation and want to share what it says, if it's significantly different or sheds light on it, I'll welcome that. Two are better than one, why? You get more done. They have a better reward for their labor. You ever tried to, to do anything by yourself? My brother is a good guy. I love him to death. He's very intellectual, very well educated. Uh, I helped him. I drove over several years ago and helped him put a deck on his house. And, uh, you know, he said, how'd you learn how to build a deck? And I sent him a picture of the one we've got 30 feet in the air on the ropes course. So not only did I build a deck, but I built a cantilever deck, you know, 35 feet off the ground on a challenge course. Uh, He called me the other day and said, I'm going to build my kids a treehouse. And I said, well, let me draw you some plans. And I've got this little drawing t- tool on my computer. And I drew him up some stuff and sent him a materials list and sent it to him. And he said, I appreciate the fact that you handed out these, sent, sent this idea to put these little joist hangers in this thing. He said, you know, but I could just butt the end of a two-by-six against my main frame and put four or five nails in there. And he said, man, that thing will hold. He said, it's got a vertical load. He says, I, I, I said, that's well and good. I said, who's going to hold that board up there while you nail it? I said, if you can hold an eight-foot two-by-six in the air with one hand and nail it with the other hand, you're much more of a man than I am. He says, oh, okay. And so the idea is if you've ever tried to do some of these projects by yourself, two are better than one because you get more done. I've got this apple tree in my backyard that is just, it looks like nine or ten trees woven together. 
the limb, I always have to trim the limbs. If the limbs are low enough for me to run under them on the lawnmower, they're, they're low. And so finally Jackie said, just get rid of it. So one afternoon she was gone. It was real close after I was getting recovered from some of my surgeries. And I thought, well, I feel good enough. I'll cut that apple tree down. And I went out there and got to work on the apple tree. Well, I exhausted myself cutting that apple tree down. So I waited a couple of days, and I thought I'll let it dry out some, and I'll go down there and trim it up. And then I decided I'll drag this thing out to the road. And so I started dragging it out to the road limb by limb. And I don't have a very big yard, and it wasn't a very big apple tree, but there's a lot of limbs on an apple tree. About the ninth trip I made out there, I thought, well, maybe, just maybe, as I cross this road, somebody will run over me in a truck, and I won't have to move any more of these apple trees. And I went in the house and got a little drink of, of some Gatorade or something, and when I walked back out, John and Shay and Ryan had come across the fence and were helping me drag that tree out. And something that it was taking me to midnight took less than an hour because I had somebody there to help me. Two are better than one because you get a better reward for your labor. If you put two sets of hands to any task, you get more done. The statistic is that, you know, 10% of the people do 90% of the work in a congregation. How much more could we get done if all the people did some of the work? If we were more contributors than spectators? You know, in the story of Paul when he's washed ashore on the island of Malta. We like that story because he gathers up a bundle of sticks and a snake comes out and bites him. And we all, that's a great vacation Bible school story because you can talk about people getting snake bit. My favorite part of that is it says, and the natives, considering him to be a murderer and have escaping the wrath of the sea, assuming he would swell up and die, sat down and watched him. What a nice group of people they are. You know that, and we always get wrapped up on, on hey, this snake bit Paul. Why is Paul even snake bit? Well, he picked up a bundle of sticks. What's he doing with a bundle of sticks? He's going to put them on a fire. You know, he's putting sticks on a fire he didn't start. They've been in the sea. Their boat has been knocked to pieces by the waves. They get on floatsome, and they, they come ashore on this island. There's 300-plus people on this boat and none of them gets lost in the sea. And when they arrive, it's cold, it's raining, and the natives of that island have built a fire. And Paul is adding sticks to a fire he didn't build. It's very, very important for us to understand that if we want the benefits of a congregation, we've got to put some sticks on that fire. You know, there may be some people here who are charter members of the Church of Christ that meets at Maysville. Some of you, I think, may be worshiped in that little white church building over there near the uh, Hurricane Creek. I think I've heard some people say they were baptized over there in the creek. Well, if we want it to be here, we've got to be willing to make contributions to that fire. So two are better than one. Why? You get a better reward for your labor. What's next? Two are better. Two better one because there's safety in numbers. Uh, the, the next verse says, if he falls down, his friend can help him up. You ever got stuck? Been in a bad spot? Taking a fall? You know, I, I'm real diligent to tell Jackie where I'm going to be when I'm hunting. Because some of the rough terrain that I hunt in, something as simple as a sprained ankle, and you're going to spend the night there. And if you fall down, if you hit, if you go down and there's nobody there to help you up, man, that's, that's a mess. Uh, I was, and I probably tell too much about myself, and it, you probably don't think I'm a healthy person, but I was running one time and jogging, chewing gum, and down the road. And I thought, what would happen if you swallowed this gum and choked yourself? You'd be laying out here by the side of the road flopping, and there nobody would stop and help you. You know, nobody says anything to you. I've had a beer bottle thrown at me once on Gurley Pike. That's the most attention I've ever got while running. Uh, and so I began to think, so here you are running, and you think, I wonder if I could give myself the Heimlich maneuver and how hard you'd have to run into something to make yourself spit gum. And, you know, it was a cool summer afternoon, and I thought, 
Let's just try that. So I put my fist down and started heading toward the telephone pole. You know, you can make yourself cough like that real easy. And I don't know what the people driving by me thought, but I know that if I swallow my gum while I'm jogging, I can get that thing out of there. I don't know what the people driving by think about me. And I don't wear a shirt that says I preach at Maysville so they don't know who I am. But I wanted to figure out. Well, you think about just being somewhere and you fall down. If somebody falls down, his friend can help him up. But this next verse, Woe to him who is alone and falls down. Man. You know, I read stories about these guys get out in the wilderness and get hurt. I read stories about hunters who fall out of their tree stands. Guys wreck their bikes. Both motorcycles and pedal bikes. And sometimes you lay a long, long time before somebody realizes you're missing and comes to look at you. Are we concerned about the people who fall from our congregation? I, I don't like Garth Brooks as a singer, but I love the lyrics of his songs. And I've got an old cassette tape somebody made me, and, and, and it's, it's not even a song you probably ever heard on the radio. But one of the lines of the songs is a guy's riding, and he's riding watch on a cattle herd. And one line just strikes me to the core. It says, I spent a long time thinking about the ones the wolves pulled down. He's out here in the dark, alone on his horse. And he looks over his herd. And he knows that there's some cows missing because the wolves got them. Do we spend any time thinking about the ones the wolves pull down? The ones that get weak or get hurt or get lost and... They don't have anybody to help them up. It's very, very important for us to be people of encouragement. It's very, very important for us to be people of, of compassion. When, when you're hurt, when you're struggling, when you're weak, how wonderful is it when somebody pulls up to help you? How wonderful is it when you, you go in the backyard and somebody's there to help you bear your burden? Two are better than one. You, you get more work done. There, there's more reward for your labor. Number two, if somebody falls down, you have somebody to help you, and it's, it's a bad thing if you're by yourself and there's no one to help you up. The third reason, why are two better than one? I know it makes everybody uncomfortable, so I'll read it. If two lie down together, they will keep warm. And how can one keep warm alone? You know, I may just tell the teenagers in Texas, just ignore this verse. <laughs> Y'all are not allowed to apply this practically. But you know, we gather heat from each other. If we come in here and it's been unseasonably cool the night before, the deacon in charge of the flamethrower will turn the heat up. Oh, I am so hot-natured. And you fill this auditorium up with warm bodies and people sitting close together and a, a room that's a maybe a little warm, it gets slap hot. You know, some of the kids, everybody in here older than me, we remember going to school without air conditioner. You guys would probably think you're going to die if you had to go to school without an air conditioner. But you put 25, 30 kids in a room, and man, it gets hot. Well, you think about being in a situation where you needed to really stay warm for survival, where you needed to, to have close company. Lonnie Beth has got a new little dog, and uh, he's about two... Point three pounds worth of Yorkie. And Yorkies don't have an inner coat of hair like a real dog does. He's, they're synthetic dogs. They're not real dogs. And uh, he can't, he's not warm like a regular dog is because he doesn't have that undercoat that most of your canines have like a wolf or a coyote or whatever's been bred out of them. So this little meatball is just a piece of fuzz. And if it's cold, if it's cold to us, it's cold to a dog uh, or cold to him. Now, most dogs don't worry about being cold until it gets real, real cold. But this little fella has to be warm all the time. And if you go in and you pick him up, he'll just snuggle up with you. He'll crawl in your pocket. He'll get, he likes to sit behind your head on the couch when I guess he's getting that body heat off of you. And what, what the, Solomon's point is that we have resources, we have strength, we have warmth that we share with each other. You ever visited a cold congregation? And I guess I'm not talking about temperature now. 
You ever walked into a place and, and didn't feel like people were warm? Didn't feel like people extended their hand of friendship to you? I, I've done that once or twice. I've been places and, and, and this is tough. And I'm not going to mention who or where. Well, I'm going to mention where, but not specifically where. But as a student, I was driving north on uh, 65, and I made a detour to come through Huntsville because I went to college with a fella. And my detour brought me by a certain church in town. And I stopped. I had the boy's name. I knew his daddy was an elder. And all I wanted to do was borrow a phone. See, there was a time when there weren't cell phones in your cars. And so I stopped at this place and went to a church, identified myself. I'm a student at Harding University. I preach at this church. I'm on my way to hold a gospel meeting. And the lady looked out that little window and said, you can't come in here. I said, I'm hunting the son of an elder in the church. Name the name. You can't come in here. And there I stood outside a church of our people. And they wouldn't let me in. Not to use the phone, not to use the bathroom, not to do nothing. And so I drove on my way. As things would have it in 1986... I moved back to Huntsville. And as the new kid in town, I got invited to preach at a certain church on a Sunday morning. <laughs> can you guess what I preached on? I bet you can. In another situation, I had a guy call and ask me, say, Lonnie, I want you to speak to my youth group. We're going to go over here to Paint Rock Valley and do a retreat. And... Will you, I said, man, you're coming to Paint Rock Valley. You will drive right by my house. He said, oh, man, that's cool. I said, you're not getting out. <laughs> he said, no, no, no. He said, I've always wanted to see how my young people would react to a homeless person. Would you pretend to be homeless and let us pick you up on the bus? I said, I can do that. So I knew they were coming in about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. and I hunted all day, hiked to the top of high top. Didn't shave, didn't bathe. I was playing the part real well. Put on some urban camouflage, some old beat-up boots. I've got an old military jacket with a Ruger symbol on the back. I stuffed my clothes in a backpack, stuck my Bowie knife right down the front of that backpack. Made me a sign that said, Woodville or Bust, and laid down under the sign at Fuel City. And this big old church bus comes pulling in. I'm laying up here piled up under that sign, got a toboggan on. Man, all them little kids' faces looking out that window at me. Guy gets off to pump gas, walks around, shakes my hand. Says, hey, we're going to Woodville. Three of the parents got off that bus and said, if he gets on this bus, you will lose your job. But they put me on that bus anyway because he knew I was safe. Well, I got on the bus, and all the football players on the bus surrounded me. And then all the little girls sat around the football players, and they started asking me questions who I was, where I was going, where I was born. And I, I hammed it up. I played the part. Told him I was a woodcutter, had a job up in Woodville, going to top some trees for a guy. Didn't go to church much. But when the Bible was read, I didn't understand it real well. And then they talked to me the whole way to Woodville about church. About a mile from the place we are going to stay, I flagged the guy down and said, Hey, let me off right here. This is, this is where I'm supposed to meet that fellow. As I got up to get off that bus, this little cheerleader gave me her Bible. She said, Mister, I want you to have this. It's an easy to read Bible, a little pink Bible. Here I am in camouflage and a jacket and a bowie knife. I got this pink Bible in my hand. I walked off that bus and off into the darkness. Well, by the time they got to camp, I'd already jogged over there and showered and shaved, and I came out as their guest speaker with this little pink Bible. Folks, if you've ever been treated coldly, you know what it feels like. But man, if you've ever been treated warmly, that's a feeling you cannot replace. When somebody cares enough about you to say, I wish you'd just take my Bible and read it. 
And folks, warmth and caring is what we're supposed to be about. And if we have people who care about us, wow. And if we are people who care about others, wow. We've got to share that warmth between each other. Uh, I try to visit the hospitals as much as I can. And I, I don't mean to offend anybody. But I can name the people who came to my hospital room when I was sick. When I had all my troubles. Both the ones who came to Anniston and the ones who came to Huntsville Hospital. And I can still tell you by name the people who came to my house while I was laying up there and couldn't do anything. And I knew it was important to do. But man, when it's done for you, wow, it means something. It is really, really special. Share your warmth. So two are better than one. Why? You get more done. You have safety. If, if one falls down, somebody can help him up. You share warmth between each other. And then what's the next one? Two are better than one. Why? One may be overpowered, but two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. There's probably two points there instead of one, but I think he adds the thing about the, the, the three-stranded cord as an uh, emphasizer for the first one. One can be overpowered, but two can defend themselves. Now, we understand that, that principle. Uh, with police officers... You know, our guys aren't supposed to just go to a call alone. We don't ride dual unless you've got, you know, somebody who's your, you're an FTO or training somebody. But, you know, if John or Chuck or Jim goes on a call, the dispatch will send not just one unit but another unit there, and you always have at least two police officers who get out. Uh, if you go into a, a situation and it's life-threatening, the police officers spread out and triangulate the person that they're looking at. And that's basically the idea of you can't attack both of them at the same time. But if you're by yourself, you can be overpowered. If you're alone, you can be taken advantage of. The, the young people, when we take them off places, we tell them, hey, minimum groups of three. You stay with each other. It's not because we don't trust them. It's because we want them to be safe and have companionship. And just on reflecting on this, have you ever noticed how it's harder to be tempted when you're with a group of Christians? You ever been with a group of Christians and all of you decide to do the wrong thing together? It was pretty, pretty easy to do the right thing when you've got one sane person in the group who says, look, I'm going to do it, but I ain't going to do it. But if you're by yourself and temptation comes... If you're by yourself and you get in a situation, it is hard to defend yourself against temptation. But if you've got numbers, if you've got a group, I try to encourage our young people to have Christian friends, to have the same values. Because if you hang out with people and you've got opposing values, you've got differing values, it's real easy to compromise your values when you're alone and by yourself. I don't work out much with anybody. I work out by myself. But when I do work out with folks, one night a week I go train with SWAT. And whereas I might quit or drop out or not do, and if you've got a bunch of other guys there who are pushing you, it's real easy to stay up and, and, and do what you're supposed to do. I know when you get a bunch of guys working out together, that influence, that encouragement. You're not overcome by fatigue. You're not overcome by the desire to quit. You're not overcome by a desire to stop. Because one person by himself, not, not very strong. But two people can defend themselves. Two people can make sure that, that the other person stays safe. Um, I was training one night, and we got a call to uh, 
go to a church building. And there's a little bit bigger auditorium than this, and instead of it being fan-shaped, it was rectangular shape. It probably seat 800 people. And we put a guy in the press box, the sound room, <laughs> where Lon sits, and, uh, you know, he's up there with, with a rifle. He says, I can see all the way to the cross aisle. He's past the cross aisle. I can't see. So you've got a 400-seat auditorium, and he can look and, and pretty well clear it from where he's at. And then you've got another whole section of the auditorium that this guy from the sound room can't see. And uh, I saw Mickey and Carrie walk up to that cross aisle, and they leaned against each other back to back. And Mickey looked this way, and Carrie looked this way, and they walked up that aisle. And one guy never looked behind him. They walked down that aisle knowing the other guy had their back. Now, if you're in an auditorium and it's dark and you don't know where the bad guys are, I don't know how much you trust somebody to walk down that aisle in the dark and never look over your shoulder. But those two guys trusted each other. And they depended on each other. And they leaned on each other. And they knew literally... This guy's got my back. And folks, when our dedication to Christianity and our dedication to service and our dedication to moral rightness is such that we can lean on each other for strength, we can't be overcome by any foe, by any temptation, or by anything that comes our way. And then he says a three-fold cord or a cord with three strands is not quickly broken. And, and I know you've, you know that. You know, if you take just a simple rope and you cut it, it's made up of individual fibers. The ropes that we used to climb with will hold 7,000 pounds. But the inside of that rope it looks like you've taken just a long bundle of hair. And it's not even woven. It's not even spun. It's just stuck in there. Now, the specialty climbing ropes are twisted so they'll stretch. But these ropes that are, that'll hold, it's just a bunch of little nylon strings all running together, all at the same time, all in the same direction. And there's no way you'll break one. There's, we were going to do a vector pull on a tree. We cut this tree down. It was in a guy's pond. And if you, and, and it was hard to get an angle on it, so we put a rope in it and attached it to a truck and pulled and put pressure on it. Now, when you've got a straight line between two points and, and the angle of incident in the middle is 180 degrees, if you put pressure on that, then you put 575% of the load on both legs. It's called a vector pull. It's a mistake that a lot of people make. Uh, when they're rigging stuff in the high angle because they pull stuff out of the wall because as you approach, as, as your weight increases, you can approach infinity on the tension. And so we decided we put, and it was a retired climbing rope. It was a rope that we'd used and wasn't going to use anymore. And so in order to get our vector pull on it, we, we put a Prusik knot. Now you, you wrap this knot around a rope and you cinch it and it will not slide in the direction of pressure. They will slide under 1,500 pounds of pressure. If a, a three wrap on a four wrap, and I have no idea what it takes to make it slide. So we loaded this system up, and we're trying to pull this tree over. I waded out into the pond with a chainsaw, which is very interesting anyway, wading in a pond with chainsaw when you're short. But anyway, we, we notched this old tree and started putting a, the pull on it. And as, and as we approached the pull on this truck, I started smelling something. Because we're putting a load that would exceed, and that Prusik knot, only one in, in a 25-year career climbing, only time I've ever seen a Prusik knot move. But it didn't break that rope. It melted into the ropes, and the two ropes became one. But it didn't break. What would happen if we aligned ourselves and wove ourselves together like a braid-on-braid braid rope, and we became... A single cord. There's a, a song in our youth song books. It says, bind us together, Lord, bind us together. We sing it now with chains that cannot be broken. But when I first heard it, it was cords. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. And I think the emphasis is that 
that a cord by itself can be broken. But when you weave it together with another cord and another cord and another cord, no, at some point it can't be broken. Solomon finds value in companionship. Solomon finds value in unity. Solomon finds value in association with other people. Because if we work together, we get more done. If one of us is wounded, the other person can help them when they fall. If we need to share warmth, two people can generate that warmth. We can defend ourselves against temptation. We can defend ourselves against any onslaught. And once you add those cords and you weave us together, a cord of multiple strands is not quickly broken. In fact, in in some cases it can't be broken. And so when Solomon talks about all the things that are meaningless, one of the things he finds value in is friendship, companionship, camaraderie. And then as we mentioned earlier, the other thing that he finds value in is service to God. Go ahead and and turn all the way over to the end end of the book. Ecclesiastes 12, 9. Not only was the teacher wise, but he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails, given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making of books, there's no end. And much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And so Solomon puts a bow on his discussion of what life is about. And the things he finds valuable, wisdom, diligence, companionship, and service to God. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the study tonight. I hope it's been meaningful to you. And thank you for coming.